All right, welcome back. Um, we're going to talk about one of my favorite authors today. We're going to talk about a man named John Dos Passos. If you look at the two photographs above the picture of the um, inside of that book with all those faces and the banner that says USA, the two men pictured are Ernest Hemingway on the left and John Dos Passos on the right. Uh, this is both, I think, during their World War I service. And if you look at the bottom underneath the book there, that's a picture of Dos Passos as an older man. Um, the reason why these two guys are pictured up at the top is because during uh, his active career, Dos Passos was um, a bigger writer than Ernest Hemingway. And it's very interesting because today nobody knows who John Dos Passos is outside of literary circles, and everybody's heard of Hemingway. There was a big literary campaign, big press campaign, to pump up Hemingway and his books as being emblematic of the era. And I think, having read Hemingway and Dos Passos, that this is the guy that people should be reading, and us especially. So I'm going to try to make that argument to you and explain to you why I think so. But as you can hear, my child in there uh, needs my attention. So I'm going to have to go deal with that. <clears throat> I do prefer to do these videos all in one take. I think it's more honest uh, that way. I think it gets something better out of me um, without the ability to constantly go back and revise your statements. Uh, but that... that um, that little person in there is uh, not going to allow it. So I'll be right back. First, we'll talk about the background of John Dos Passos and explain some of the contradictions that hopefully point to why he can produce these very interesting works that are worthy of our attention. Dos Passos was born a bastard. His father was an older man with money who had a sick wife. And since his wife was sick, and I guess he didn't feel a great deal of attachment towards her, he found John Dos Passos' his mother, got her pregnant, and uh, would not divorce his wife. He waited until she died. So eventually, after his wife died, which I think maybe took 10 years or more, um, he did eventually marry John Dos Passos' his mother, and uh, legitimized the son. But even though John Dos Passos did not grow up with the father in the home, uh, the father did support him financially and make sure that his son attended good educational uh, institutions and provided, provided for the, this, this illegitimate second family he'd started. And so that aspect comes through in these literary works by Dos Passos that I've read. He talks about this uh, extensively through his characters who are missing fathers or whose fathers die uh, when the kid is at a young age. So this is, this is a similar kind of, his, like his own life experience somewhat comes out in the characters that he writes about. And so uh, the young Dos Passos gets an Ivy League education and volunteers to be an ambulance driver in the First World War. And so he is in the same age bracket as people like Ezra Pound, Hemingway, the statistician Ronald Fisher in England, all these guys who were of military age during World War I. So Dos Passos uh, serves in that capacity. And if you want to know what life was like for this small group of upper crust uh, American, young American elites, I'd recommend for you to go watch a film called The Razor's Edge featuring Bill Murray. There's two versions of the film, and it's, uh, it's very good, very interesting about that time period. But if you watch that film, and then you read this novel, and pay attention to the character who, who does that in the novel, I think you'll get a pretty well-rounded idea. Um, th so Dos Passos comes from this privileged background, uh, but his main interest is really the white working class in America. That's who he's really interested in, and that's who he identifies with. That's who his people are. He wasn't born into that background, but that's who he identifies with. And like a lot of people of his era, he does it through leftist politics. So he sympathizes with the labor movement. He sympathizes with unions, sympathizes with the IWW or the Wobblies, 
which were, you know, an internationalist uh, union type. And the reason why he comes into those leftist politics is because he empathizes and sympathizes with the white working class, and he doesn't like the capitalists, he doesn't like the bankers, and he doesn't like the American political establishment. And so he reacts to, he reacts against those things by going into this worker-based, labor, union, leftist type politics. Um, now, this book is written in 1932, okay? Something happened to Dos Passos around uh, the latter part of the 1930s, and that was the Spanish Civil War. Like many of these other guys of this background and from this era, he was interested in that, and I think he went to Spain. And he saw something there that changed his life and his politics forever. And um, I'll, uh, I'll get back to you in just a second about that. And so in response to the events um, that these kind of people like Dos Passos and George Orwell witnessed in the Spanish Civil War, they uh, sort of refined their viewpoint. And I haven't read uh, John Dos Passos' later works, and I haven't read his political works, his nonfiction, of which there's a very great deal, but uh, it seems like he would be a great candidate for moving into the neoconservatism that would end up dominating American politics on the so-called right for the second half of the 20th century um, and into the 21st century, too. It seems like he would be one of these guys. Because this is people like people like Bayard Rustin, people like John Dos Passos, who had been alienated by the contradictions of the left, would then move into this anti-communist stuff. Whether he did that, I don't really know. Um, but he he would he would be a candidate for it. Now, talking specifically about his novels, he um, it's it's really difficult to define him. What he does in these books is he takes characters from all over the country, from all over America, from the different places, and he writes about them in an empathetic and sympathetic way. He uh, takes people from the lower white working class, from the white middle class, and from the upper class, and writes about them all and tries to make them sympathetic and understandable characters. Um, he stresses the different regional components of the country, and the things that are important to people who live in different areas and who have to worry about different things. There is one memorable scene in which um, one of the main characters named Joe, who's from Virginia, he's in a bar and he's talking to two guys from out west. And the two guys from out west are essentially Reds. You know, they're not like full-blown Bolsheviks, but they're essentially Marxists. And they... the Joe and these other guys basically agree about what needs to be done with America. They don't like the banks, they don't like the ruling class, and they want to see some kind of better society. Um, and then Joe, because he's from Virginia, comments that he would really like to see uh, a, a socialism or a, a big union for white men. Okay, because growing up in Virginia, he's got a very strong racial consciousness because he's grown up around black people his entire life. And these guys from out west basically scoff at him and say that all Southerners are scabs or strike busters, you know, uh, people who cross the picket line, and then they get ready to fight. So Dos Passos is able to describe how even though all these people are Americans and they all have similar, um, similar goals in a sense, their regionalism uh, creates conflict and differences between them. But then this is all smoothed over by the bartender, who's a German, and he, uh, he gets everybody to be friends again. So it's not a pessimistic outlook uh, at the lower level. Um, talking about these working class people, Dos, Dos Passos is very positive. And um, the way that he treats the upper class and the upper middle class is um, much rougher. He's very, very tough on them. The main character, I would say, in 1919 is a young guy from a good background who's fallen on difficult financial times. So the father did not manage the finances properly. And this is a story that you've heard about the nobility in um, America and Europe 
you know, over the last 200 years. Uh, old families who used to run in the military and have a very good standard of living and who had social prestige just can't make it in modern capitalism. There's too much there that has to do with honor and duty and service that just does not translate into a capitalist system. So these people fall on hard times, but he's able to get, uh, because he's high IQ and he comes from one of these formerly elite families, he's able to get into the Ivy League with some scholarships and help from people. But he indulges in a great deal of alcohol abuse and adultery with women and... He also becomes a homosexual. So you've got a guy who's an alcoholic, an adulterer with women, and has, you know, uh, gay sex with men. So this is what is described as being one of these guys who joins the ambulance corps and volunteers for World War I. And that's what happens to this guy. And when he gets to Europe, he um, continues to whore his way across Europe and um, uh, drink himself, you know, and, you know, we, I would say drink himself into an early grave, but as far as I've gotten in the novel, which is basically to the last five pages, um, he's not actually suffering any health effects, but he's a total alcoholic, and all these guys are, as it's described. So what Dos Passos is really doing is he's taking the shine off these myths about America that were established to get America into World War I and then to legitimate afterwards America's particip participation in it. One of the main characters in the 42nd Parallel, which is the first book in the trilogy, uh, his name is J. Ward Morehouse, and you may have heard of this expression called climbing the greasy pole, and this refers to being in a political party and trying to reach the top position. Um, this is what J. Ward Morehouse does his entire life, as it's depicted in the two novels. And uh, by luck, unscrupulousness, and uh, a total um, uh, inability to give up, so we would call that grit. So through grit, luck, and unscrupulousness, J. Ward Morehouse climbs all the way to being the right-hand man of Edward Mandel House dealing with the Versailles Treaty. Okay, so that's why it's important for us to read this stuff that John Dos Passos wrote because in 1932 he's talking about the role of advertising and marketing working directly with the White House, directly with Woodrow Wilson and making untold millions off of the sacrifice of all these lives on our side and the other side. And um, the way that the sexual politics, the way that the sexual issues are dealt with, I, I find is very fresh and modern um, in the sense that he is attacking licentiousness. He is attacking um, over-sexualization. So he shows the consequences of all this unbridled sexual activity and lack of self-control repeatedly throughout the novel, men are getting women pregnant, men are being subjected to um, uh, very difficult situations through indulging their sexual desires. Uh, venereal disease plays a, large, um, plays a large part of many of the characters. You know, they keep getting VD because they cannot keep their, you know, forgive, forgive my language, because these men can't keep their dick in their pants. So they keep getting VD. Um, and they keep getting women pregnant, they have to try to procure abortions, and Dos Passos is absolutely brutal in depicting this stuff, okay? And he's not doing it in this sort of, um, you know, like Philip Roth style thing where you're basically wallowing in the excrement of your own um, moral failures. That's not what he's doing here. He's showing that these things are not good. They're not good for you. They're not good for other people. And um, he, he, sh he shows that they're moral failings, essentially. And he does it from a secular viewpoint, which is difficult to accomplish. So kudos to him for doing that. But one of the refrains is um, a guy who's just gotten a, gotten a girl pregnant 
and she wants to actually have the baby. He's trying desperately to procure an abortion for her so that he doesn't get stuck to have to deal with the child or go to jail or something like that. Uh, because, yeah, imagine back then you might actually face real consequences for getting a woman pregnant, even if you didn't have any money. They might just throw you in jail, right? Um, so the refrain is, you know, it's a real shame in this world that a guy has to hurt other people to have a good time. And the solipsism and the nihilism and the hedonism of this kind of mindset is something that Dos Passos just hammers away, just hammers at the entire time. So it's a very well-rounded and very interesting idea. Um, so just to tack on with the Edward Mandelhaus stuff, um, another thing that Dos Passos does throughout the novel is he, at one point he gives a character portrait of uh, J.P. Morgan, okay? And he doesn't give us the entire key to understanding this, right? There's no intimation of who was actually behind uh, J.P. Morgan, who he was a front for. He doesn't talk about that. But he talks about J.P. Morgan in a way that will stimulate people into thinking about the role of money in American politics and finance and debt. The other uh, very interesting reveal that he let out was... There are these people in the American uh, State Department, top brass, military, the people who are basically running the show in World War I. And uh, one of them, who, one of the people who's hanging out in this decision-making group, is a representative from Standard Oil. He's just one of these people who's just an alcoholic and hanging out with all the decision-makers in Paris after the, after the armistice. And he's talking about the Russian Civil War and the revolution that's going on. And by this point, they've already had the October Revolution. And so the Kerensky people are, you know, they're out of it. We're now dealing with the Bolsheviks versus the White Army. And this guy from Standard Oil is talking about how the British are using the instability in Russia to try to get into... Azerbaijan and take over the Baku oil fields and this guy who's in the American ruling class essentially and who's the representative for Standard Oil he says that he would prefer the Bolsheviks to get control of the Baku oil fields just to keep the British out okay and this is very interesting to me because I did a bunch of primary research on that subject after I read about it in uh, Anthony Sutton's first volume of Western Technological Transfers to the Soviet Union. And you would see that it was the Harriman people and the Bush people um, who got the Baku oil fields up and running again after the Civil War for the Soviets. So the Americans, in this very interesting sense, were making an alliance. Or so, let's just say that some people in the American elite were totally comfortable with making an alliance with Bolshevism just to try to muscle the British out of economic interest in oil. Okay, And so these kind of issues that Dos Passos brings up for people who are paying attention, absolutely explode the entire moral basis for the First World War and probably everything that you've heard about the First World War and Second World War from official sources. People have kind of forgotten about um, World War I in a, in a big way because uh, all of the propaganda that was cooked up for World War II about the Germans was kind of a rehash of the same stuff they said in the First World War. So. If they publicize the issues in the First World War too much, it really exposes the Second World War as not being the great uh, crusade for democracy and justice that was intended. So um, this book um, from 1932, uh, I think, is, is it's worth your time as a piece of fiction. So if you like to read fiction, get this book. I'm sure you can get a used copy for 3 or $4. This modern printing... Okay, is garbage, uh, Mariner, Mariner Press, okay? 
I have a, an original copy of this in paperback and there are no typos and misspellings. And in this copy from Mariner Press, which you know you'd pay probably 10 or $12 for, there's typos. Come on. I mean, I know I've got typos in the DeBruschka book that I put out, but I'm just a one-man operation. It's just me, right? Uh, these people, on the other hand, who God knows how many proofreaders and editors and all this other all this other stuff that they have, they've really got no excuse for it. So get a, get an old an, an old copy if you can if you can get one. I'm sure you can get them for cheap, um, which I think kind of brings us full circle. Um, Dos Passos is buried. Okay, he's underground. No one is going to talk about this guy because of the things that I'm bringing up right now. Um, there is uh, a scene in the in 1919, I think, where one of the characters is in the Caribbean, and they refer to a large group of black men as a big bunch of buck niggers. Okay, that's that's like off the table in terms of modern political sensibilities. There's also a scene, and I think it's 1919, in which a Jewish clerk is holding up a guy from getting his um, something he needs to work, basically like a license or a permit. And uh, the, the guy refers to him, the Jew as being a little kike. And so these things are just off the table. Um, this Passos is not going to be read and he's not going to be talked about. But for people like us with some discernment and some interest in history, I think it's, it's good. Um, and by comparison, what you're going to get instead is you're going to get Hemingway, and you're going to get people like um, like John Steinbeck, who's another guy from this era who is what you would get instead. And in many ways, uh, Steinbeck, Steinbeck is very similar to Dos Passos because he's also interested in the white working class. But the difference with Steinbeck is that he's an unapologetic you know, Stalinist and Marxist, and so that's why he was promoted over uh, somebody like um, those Passos. And so, what I my my source for this is to say that this book, it's called the Russian Journal. This is a propaganda piece, and I got this for two dollars. You know, all these old books that nobody wants, you can get this for two dollars. Um, this guy Steinbeck goes on a all expenses paid trip to the Soviet Union in 1947 and 48 to do a PR campaign to try to prevent the Cold War. Okay, so him and his Jewish photographer, yes, his Jewish photographer, go to the Soviet Union, and it's called a Russian journal. Okay, like many people have pointed out, Russian culture was banned in the Soviet Union. There was no Russian, uh, there was no Russian culture, there was no Russian journal. Okay, this was, this was Soviet communism. Um, I know, I know that some nationalist stuff was dug up out of the ground uh, where it had been hidden so that the uh, Soviet Union could try to stave off the uh, National Socialist attack during World War II, but to call this a Russian journal is just dishonest in my opinion. But reading from page 26, okay, and this is, this is the substitute for Dos Passos. This is who you're going to get. And um, let me uh, remind you um, what I said about the Spanish Civil War earlier and about how some people saw what happened there and realized that the Stalinists and the Marxists were uh, what they really were. Um, many of your, this is a Soviet person speaking to Steinbeck and his people in the Soviet Union. Many of your newspapers are speaking of war with the Soviet Union. Do the American people want war with the Soviet Union? We don't think so, we answered. We don't think any people want war, but we don't know. The Soviet man said, Apparently, the only voice speaking loudly in America against war is that of Henry Wallace. Can you tell me what his following is? Has he any real backing among the people? And then uh, Steinbeck and his people go on to say that um, that Henry Wallace is barnstorming the country and blowing the meeting halls open and everybody's behind Wallace and he's got the biggest crowds of anybody and he's raising more money than anybody. Um, well, Henry Wallace, along with all of these other high-level people in the uh, FDR administration, they were just communists. They came out of the Department of Agriculture. They were hired specifically from a group 
that produced all sorts of communist infiltration in that administration. And um, Henry Wallace was promoting an alliance in 1947 and 48 with the Soviet Union, rapprochement with them, and a long-term relationship. Um, and they never gave a goddamn about any gulags, about any churches that were destroyed, about millions and millions of people who were either shot or starved or just left to die or robbed of their freedom. So you got Steinbeck doing all of this PR work for the Soviet Union and for American Marxists like Henry Wallace. This is, this is what replaced those Passos, is people like Hemingway, who again, um, Hemingway never seemingly grew out of the kind of stuff that Dos Passos was criticizing in this book from those ambulance driving days. And yes, he was a man's man, but he also didn't have any control over himself, it seems. And I've read some of Hemingway's personal letters. I've some, read some of his personal correspondence, and he complained in that about the success of John Dos Passos, saying, you know, my books are better than his. I really hate the fact that he's so big. So these rivalries, um, I think, uh, they're, they're more indicative of who the media decides to promote at any given moment rather than the actual quality of the work. And having read both Hemingway and Dos Passos, I know who I'm on the side of. If you guys, um, if you guys have ever read any of this stuff or if you have any other contributions that you want to add on to this, I'd be very glad to hear it. And I'm sorry that I haven't responded to everybody's comments, and I'd really like to thank all of you guys for thanking me and encourage for I'd like to thank you for encouraging me and all your nice words that you had to say about my uh, my child that I had. And if I haven't responded to your comments, I apologize. Thank you guys.